going to, in respect to time, make sure that we're going in a very systematic way. But we are now recording and then I will go into present now. Um, and so you will see my screen in just a moment and then we will uh, begin. I always like to really ensure that we start strong with a roundtable uh, conversation just to see how everyone is doing. A check in is something that, um, you know, I found many times we're in several meetings and we have so much to, you know, go through and to do and try to get done. But at the end of the day, I think also we need to ensure that we're taking time to um, engage in conversation um, about, you know, what's happening and what's on our hearts. And so wanting to give you that um, information. So today we will be talking specifically about alternatives to suspension, building an inclusive culture of excellence and respect. And so with that in mind, I want you to really, um, we have a variety of roles, uh, of leadership roles that are on this call. We have some that are uh, dean, some assistant principals, some principals, uh, some instructional um, leaders and specialists. Um, and so with that in mind, counselors, it really I felt like we needed to have a mixed audience because we all, in fact, have a shared um, ownership in the culture of the buildings in which we serve. And so we have a unique responsibility to keep our students at school. We know that if we're sending, we are sending a message every time that we are um, sending a student home for a suspension. And knowing that the magnitude of all the external factors that we're up against more or the frequency thereof of an out of school suspension, when we send a student home repetitively, they're going to then stay home. Then that's when we go to the homeschool feature or we go to we're saying we're going to do epic or we're going to just drop out and just say um, the heck with it. Forget it. And so with that in mind, knowing that we have a unique responsibility to really try to understand the root and the heart of the matter. And so I wanted to be able to provide um, my fellow leaders with a toolkit, if you will, of just some other prescriptive measures, some alternatives to ensure that when behaviors that are warranting an out of school suspension occur, which they will, um, you know, um, no matter how hopeful that we remain, there may be times where there are behaviors that are warranting an out of school suspension. But are are there some questions that we can ask ourselves as leaders? And then in turn, also, are there some, um, some other measures that we can take, some other protocols, some other approaches that we can really take the opportunity to really address the inappropriate behavior, help to reform so that it is not occurring again, but then also doing so in a way that the student is then empowered from that learning experience. And so that's what today is all about. And so just real quick, and I'll ask for uh, several of you to unmute. I know who's kind of on the call, so I'll just kind of call you out. Um, just because I want to hear uh, just that shared sense of ownership. This is a very safe environment, but this is an environment of leaders to be able to speak and to grow off of one another. And so uh, just wanting to maximize the moment. So when you think of the terms suspension, out of school suspension or expulsion, what comes to mind? Take a moment. Suspension, out of school suspension or expulsion? What comes to mind? Um, do you want us to just say answers or? Okay. Definitely. Um, I was just going to say, I think of, um, you know, students, what comes to mind first is, is negative because it's, it's students having to be away from the school. And I think, of, you know, every time I have to or have every time I have suspended people, I just know it, I do it because you know there's no maybe no alternate at the time. But I know that they're not going to go home and do their work, and I know that they're going to sometimes be at home by themselves. And so that's why I one of the reasons I've explored other alter you know alternatives to suspension. But the, I I just automatically think of you know it's a consequence, but it's usually negative. I like that. So you so you're already cognizantly aware. And I love that the consciousness that you have to know that I know that I'm going to assign this, but 
I'm looking for some alternatives. So that's even more of a reason why this is needed. So that's great that you know the negative association of what suspension does. Um, and we'll get into talking about some of the um, emotional or psychological uh, perspectives of, 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 of how uh, suspension is interpreted. But great, great, uh, great insight there, Ms. Sagely. Someone else? Well, my thought is, it was initially the pretty much the same as Andrea. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. loss of learning, right? They're, they're not at school. They're not in our safe protection. They're not getting what we know that they need. Um, but then I thought deep, more deeply about it and realized that even if they're not here learning, they're learning something. I think the things that they're learning at home are more often not the things that we really need them to know and not the things that we need them to bring back into the school. So. Uh, although it is uh, at some points unavoidable, I think it's it's important to stack up as many of those supportive uh, ways that we can uh, help the student understand what it is that uh, that they did, the impact that it had on not only themselves but to others, uh, even their other classmates, uh, is a much better lesson than sitting home or being unsupervised out into the community doing God knows what. And definitely, and well said. And so therefore, Mr. Eddie, to, to, to really to, to dive into what you've just communicated to us, you know, I find myself thinking, yes, you are learning, but what you're learning is possibly going to then, when you are returned to campus, you may engage in additional behaviors that are then going to warrant you additional time out of the classroom and out of the school building based on the you know home life, based on what you are going home to. Um, and so, or even in the absence of going home, but just to be out and not having to be able to come to the school building where you may end up. And so, right. mm -hmm. Rare, yeah, I, I hate to make this comparison because it's not a one-to-one, -one, but I, I liken it to those entering prison. They, when they go into prison and they come back out, they're not coming back out in, the, in a better way, right? They've picked up things along the way. They're bringing those out to uh, the society, and we all benefit from that. And if you take it from the penal's perspective specifically, if you then, uh, if, with, with the absence of programming or with the absence of alternatives to help you to re, you know, assimilate into society, then you may become a repeat offender. I mean, there's research done with that as well as the research um, as, as the, you know, with the preparation for this uh, specific, um, you know, session is just the aspect of, you going through these behaviors, we're not reforming the behavior. We're just simply sending a message that you're not going to be able to come to school for this amount of time because you did this. And so um, that's that's where our mindsets as leaders, you know, will uh, need to continue to shift. Mm -hmm. I think there was something placed in the chat box I wanted to uh, wanted to share. And so Ms. Charbonneau has said, let me go to the chat real quick. Ms. Charbonneau said that it's also a result, um, is a result that may be the intent of their behavior, which is further reinforcing undesired behavior. And so I, I think that that is uh, worth mentioning as well, that, you know, in the absence of having something strong, in the absence of having um, a, a really refined plan or refined strategy to help someone to be successful and understand what they did wrong and to understand that if, you know, the same uh, behaviors that you engaged in, if the situations arise where you feel that you're going to engage in those same behaviors that really warrant you being suspended out of school, how can I thoroughly address that in a way that is going to not, you know, cause me to be stagnant or cause me to uh, lose out and have to then be a, a suspended from school again. I think Ms. Bunch, you unmuted. I know you wanted yes. to share. Yes, although I realize that there are some things that we will encounter um, in situations that will warrant suspending students. There are just going to be some things that we can't get around that that really suspension is, is what we have to do. However, mm -hmm. Um, I always think about suspension that we suspend them for an undesired behavior. But we expect them to go home in a situation where they are away from the structured environment and come back. They're going to come back and be expected to behave the way we 
support them to behave in that structured environment, but then we have sent them away. So now they're out of the routine of school. They're out of the routine of doing what they need to do. So I am all for finding a way to get them to understand that, yes, there are consequences for decisions that you make that result in you know, poor behavior because we do have a standard that, you know, we must adhere and, and follow when we're at school. But I just don't know that taking them away from the learning environment is always the best route of, of doing that. Because what I've seen on the end of, of high school, and I think there are some other people on the call who can attest to this, that they're out just hanging out. They're in the park or they're just at a friend's house or they're just doing whatever. They're, they're not getting what they need and, and ultimately we want them to still be learning because we still want them to be successful. Ms. Bunch, you said it. And I mean, that's the, that's every slide here alludes to just that. And that's the thing. We'll do a suspension. The student comes back. And like we spoke in that September session, when we talked about the re-entry and how important a re-entry meeting is, that, that is critical. I mean, we need to definitely have an opportunity for us to really say that, OK, you know, you're coming back today. But then what measures are we putting into place? You have had to be suspended from school. But what's being put in place for to help you to reinforce, you know what I mean, the aspect that that behavior that warned you to be suspended from school is unacceptable. But however, here is how you would manage or how you are to problem solve in order to then move forward and not have that occur again. So I appreciate you saying that, and we'll continue to dive forward in that um, in the in the slides that are remaining. But that was well said. Uh, Miss Andrews too has implemented has put in the chat that uh, she feels like we should be very cautious with suspension, not to overuse it or to allow it to become the student's identity. Um, it needs to be very strategic and productive. And so as we, you know, and that's something that as leaders, and I'm going to go ahead and say this. You know, when we receive, and Mr. Dorn, I think you have your hand up, so I'll come to you just shortly after I say this. The thing to keep in mind, I don't always like to look at those log entries when we receive a student at the elementary level. And the reason because is if I sit there and there is a, you know, two or three pages of what all a student has done, that can easily taint my perspective of that young person before I even get, before I even put eyes on them. And so with that in mind, it is very, very, um, you know, we have to very watch our words, watch our actions. And then also, too, when I've had to redirect conversations, even with classroom educators and, you know, um, and others that are working within the building, because if a student has a history of being suspended, that is something that, you know, I understand that, you know, you're wanting to share with a receiving teacher or whatever it might be. But really, that becomes that student's identity. That becomes what that student is known for. And you can't tell me that when you've heard that you've got a student that is always suspended and always doing this and that, that you really, as an educator, I know for myself, I mean, we're human. We're going to be thinking, OK, I wonder how this what this day is going to look like. You know, I'm just waiting to see until you do something, because I know this is what you know what I mean. I know what I've been told. And so therefore, we begin to operate from a whole nother perspective. And so then we're we become a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. So uh, well said with that, that identity is very critical as, you know, many of the uh, students that we serve, they are, they, they, they have come from, you know, very, very catastrophic backgrounds. Um, and, and knowing that, you know, sometimes the behavior, you know, whether it being a teaching opportunity, we find ourselves assigning a 10 or 15 day suspension. So definitely. Mr. Dorner, Yes, thank you. I'm sorry that uh, Ms. Cooper and I were late, but we had uh, another meeting scheduled for data. No what comes to mind with the team that I've been working with here at the 7th and 8th grade academy is um, restorative justice. And, you know, I think the student needs to know here is what the matrix says. Here is what the consequence that has been laid out before you is. But we give them an opportunity to explain their side. We look and see if there was some trauma or there was some other factors that may have caused this behavior. And then we, upon appeal or even upon before a suspension goes through, we allow them 
to uh, take part in some type of reconciliation, some type of how do we make this better? How do I make atonement for my actions? Sometimes it can be as simple as uh, an apology or uh, some type of a peer mediation. So those are some things that we've practiced. Um, this restorative justice idea that um, we don't want this to continue to happen, but the student has to take a part in how did my actions impact my classmate? How did they impact my teacher? How did they impact the learning environment? And um, I think that's very powerful when the when the student themselves has a voice in what their consequences are. Well said, and we'll definitely be mentioning that as well as we move through as one of the strategies that I wanted to make mention of, uh, Mr. Dorna. So well said with that. That's definitely worth mentioning. And 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 that that shared sense, that ownership culture, because just as we talk about as we really are moving, um, even as a district from more teacher centered instruction to student centered, um, you know, those outcomes, that's going to be, you know, that's critical. I, I feel like our students, you know, we're always you're just they're, they're, they almost look to be, and we see this in the elementary school, especially upper elementary, you know, where they're just waiting for the teacher versus just diving in and going on and, you know what I mean, and moving forward and knowing it's just like we're on a cliffhanger. And so it's like, that's what we're taught. We're ready for, okay, what's the next thing? I've got to be guided through every, every, I'm told everything and I don't have any necessary voice in the heart of the matter. So then when it comes to the high school level, then we're already, you know, we're checked out with it. It's just like, you know, I mean, it, it's flat out. It's not anything that my voice does not matter. It's been silenced ever since kindergarten when I've been told that, wait, you know, quiet, this, that, you know, everything has been told to me and have not been given that opportunity as I matriculate through. So now, you know, while you wanting me to share, are you wanting, you know, I, I finally get voices. Like I don't have anything to say because I've been silenced for so long, you know, and so the only way that I am able to communicate is because I'm acting a fool and tearing up the school or, you know, doing this or doing that and all of the behaviors because I know that in my mind, I've had that Pavlovian experience that just like with Pavlov's dog, you ring the bell, here comes the food. Well, okay, you act a fool, you at home. I mean, it's a, it, it just, it's, it's the same thing. I know what I, and, and, and if it's the lack of my educational, um, you know, the needs for my education, you know, had that not been addressed because nobody took time to even talk to me, but the only th time that they did talk to me was when they were calling my parents to tell them I'm on a five to seven day suspension. See? So great, great conversation. Um, I, I never thought that three words would really bring out so much, but it really does. So uh, moving forward. So our purpose. So as leaders, we know that we're committed to ensuring educational achievement, social and emotional development for every student that's throughout our district. And so whether it's at ECC or whether it's at the senior high school, the purpose of our session today is to simply identify the truth about out of school suspension. We want to understand effects of out of school suspension. We also want to look at some of the social, emotional and educational effects that out of school suspension has on students. And then we also want to explore some of the alternatives to out of school suspension. And so really just wanted to talk through the truth behind suspension. And so, you know, and this could be for us in school, but specifically with out of school suspension, uh, because really in school suspension is a is a is a alternative to going home. Um, and it's just that, you know, I believe our next session will talk through what that programming looks like for an effective ISS. Um, and so that will have that in second semester. So be out on the lookout for an invite for that. But the truth behind specifically with out of school suspension. What does it do? Well, at, from my experience, from working in a variety of different roles and working in with a couple of different districts uh, or several districts, actually, um, this is what I, I, I'm finding. This is what's even within the research. It gives the administrators and the teachers a break, but it's also at the expense of the student's educational achievement. Okay. It quickly but ineffectively, it removes a problem or a challenge for a set period of time. 
So for example, you know, it's just been building. A child has been, you know, acting out, you know, here, there, and yonder. They do something, get in a fight. Okay, I'm, you're out. I'm, I'm too done. I need a break. And that's what I hear. And that's what I have heard. And I'm sure that you all have heard that as well. I, I'm tired of it. I, you just got, you, you know, you got you three days and, or, you know, something's out on a Friday. You tell them, okay, yeah, I'll see you. I'll see you Monday. Something happened on a Wednesday, Thursday. Tell them I'll see you next Monday. You know, we need a break. And that's what, you know, rather than even sitting down and even having an opportunity to figure out all the details, figuring out what's going on with this young person, you know, and, and how can I help rather than to simply say, OK, you're out. Um, it also what does it do? It weakens the student's motivation. If we continue it down the cycle when we're talking about like Miss Andrews, Miss Bunch said a repeat offender, you know, at the end of the day, if you repeat it, this becomes a you know repetitive behavior pattern, then you know, my motivation to succeed in the classroom it's lessened each and every suspension. So I know that the more time that I'm spending at home, I don't have to connect with what's going on in the classroom. I don't have to even face the challenges of me not being able to perform at the level of all of the other students in the classroom or any of that. Um, it also sends a message that we cannot help you because if our students are coming to us, our parents have brought us the best that they have and whether they are able to provide more and don't, that's not our place. Even though we know in the reality, had they been our biological children, that we would be working to ensure that circumstances and perhaps life, um, you know, life, just day to day life may look different for them. Nevertheless, we're brought what we're brought and we can't change that. But what we can do is to transform and to provide while we have uh, them in our school buildings, on our campuses, and while we are stealing, instilling with them the appropriateness of how to conduct themselves as young people uh, becoming, you know, aspiring successful adults. That is what we what we have that opportunity to do each and every day. Um, it also communicates when we're suspending uh, students that we do not want you here. You know, um, as we saw on the picture a couple of slides ago, the lady was simply pointing out the door. We knew what that meant. If we knew what that meant, even if we were not engaged in this session, we knew what that meant. She's pointing to the door. It's clear. You could tell they're in class. It's a quick way to get you out. I've been in several schools, um, you know, not in this district, in other districts where, you know, they'll get on the radio and say, um, it's, it's time, uh, so and so has got to go. OK, I don't want them in here. Um, I, 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 or I've even had it to where teachers have come in and said to their principals before, you know, I don't want them back in my class and they leave. OK, also increasing student dropouts uh, in the dropout rate. We know that that we know that suspension does that because it's sending the message. I don't want you here. So why should I engage in this? I'm going to go ahead to the streets. I'm going to go ahead to this. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And, and I'm, I'm done with school. It also stagnates our school turnaround plans. And so as we know that, you know, with remediation that we're going to have to all engage in, no matter what building we serve in, in no matter what school we serve in, in the United States, um, we're going to have to really be strategic with how we're looking at even the second semester, the next school year, all of that becoming behind the pandemic and all of the effects, whether it be emotionally, whether it be, you know, uh, behaviorally, whether it be academically. But there's minimal achievement on rates for standardized tests for those who are repeated or repetitive offenders of being out of school or being suspended from school. And then also on time matriculation, when we're talking about retention, you know, the likelihood of those that are being uh, suspended out of school on a consistent basis. Yes, when we look at those disciplinary records, we should also look at the academic records as well, because there are going to be very congruent in the aspect of there is a decline in academic performance as there is an increase in out of school suspension. When you're not here, you're not learning. OK, flat out, you can provide paperwork, you can provide Google links, you can provide whatever you want to provide. You suspend someone from school. I'm, I, I have yet to see where they come back performing just as well as they would have if they would have been in the school building. I've yet to see a student who's been able to do that. 
And then it also increases the ability um, to schools um, and, and teachers and administrators to really retain strong relationships with the students and their families. Um, you know, it just, it, it bothers me, it bothers me, it bothers me. And yes, there have been tough discussions. And, you know, while I think the end of the day, the relationships with our parents mm. and our students has to be one that's very unwavering and that when we have to have those tough conversations, it doesn't destroy the relationship. But if there's never any work or never any goodwill spoken of about the parent or the student to the student or parents, then the absence of delivering that less than favorable information, it becomes very, very catastrophic. I mean, it, it really does. And then they're sending the message of, you know, that's when they're coming with, uh, you know, I'm taking them out, I'm going to Epic. I'm taking them out, I'm going to K-12. I'm taking them out, I'm doing this. I'm doing homeschool. I'm going to another district. I'm doing all of that. And as we are consistently declining our students, at this point, we've really got to work together to figure out how we can best support each and every student, um, no matter what background, no matter what life experience, no matter what behaviors they're communicating. Am I saying we keep everybody at school when they act, I mean, a complete, you know, fool? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that, you know, definitely it's time to really raise the intentionality within ourselves as leaders and our discernment on how we are effectively supporting the students that come to us each and every day. Then we talk about what suspension does not do. And then, I mean, it's, it's, it's self-explanatory, to be honest with you. Suspension, it does not correct misbehavior. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, when we just talked about Miss Bunch and, uh, and, and and others have said, you know, you're out at the park, you're out at, you know, neighbor's house, you're out at the, you're at Walmart, you at, um, I was going to say Dick's, but it went out of business. So uh, Dunham, you're at, you're everywhere. You bird, I mean, you know, you name it, you're there. Because, you know, it, it. did I learn anything from that? No, I didn't. I was just told I was suspended because, you know, I, I went in and I, um, you know, beat somebody down. So I'm suspended. OK, I went in and I cussed at the teacher. So I got, you know, I got three days. Um, what have I learned from that? Nothing. Because, I, you know, in the absence of having a conversation to understand, you know, I'm, I'm having frustration with the class. I'm not really understanding. My parents cussed me out before I came to school. Uh, even if I had parents at home to cuss me out. I mean, whatever it might be, we didn't take that opportunity. All we said was you going home. You know, you shouldn't have been cussing and so and so and so and so and, and went on. OK, um, really taking that opportunity. Does that in a height and a flight of fight mode, do we have time to do it? We might say no, but at the end of the day, everything that we do, we do have time because this is what we're here for. This is what we're doing. This just comes right along with the other responsibilities and rigors of the day. Suspension does not build an inclusive culture. When we're talking about a time where we are having to be socially distant, it just kills me. I hate having faculty meetings that are virtual because I am used to seeing ones, everybody's together, we're laughing, loving on one another, and that is not able to happen. And I told Miss Andrews, who's on the call, I told her this yesterday. I said, I'm sick of it. I said, it just, I, I just, I can't, it, it, it's just too much. I, I, I'm one that I, I love people. And because of that, it's very difficult, even with the session now. We're on the screen, you know, we're all in all res different respective locations and everything has had to be thought through. And so the times that we get to open school back up, I mean, you're going to have to really, really do something at Cherokee to get yourself sent back home because, you know, this year specifically, most of them has been at home most of the year. And for talking about those that have been in quarantine or whatever it might have been, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is send you back home. OK, Miss um, Andrews can tell you I've had it to where I've had ISS in my office because ISS was full with Mr. Siri in his classroom. OK, and we're having I stopped doing what I was doing. Emails came in, whatever. It didn't matter because Dr. Dyson Mendenhall can call me if you need me like that, because at the end of the day, 
I've got to work with these five or six that if I send them home, I'm doing more harm to the whole district and them as individuals than I am answering emails or joining in the meetings or anything else. So it's like whatever it takes. And so um, just talking about an inclusive culture where everybody knows that they have worth and value in the school. And so, you know, I, I it, it, it takes time. It starts at elementary. But if it's if it didn't get there, if a student hasn't been with us since their elementary years to have uh, to see consistency among leadership, among teachers and all of that, if they're moving in, we have even a more, um, you know, challenging time to try to build that inclusiveness for a student demographic that's very transient. And we know that here in Muskogee, that is what we see a lot of transientness um, in our students. Student, uh, student body, but nevertheless, it does not build an inclusive culture. Uh, suspension also does not be, uh, prevent behavior uh, from warranting suspension and that occurring again. So we know that, you know, the likelihood of something, um, you know, happening again in the same manner is favorable. You fought today, somebody made you mad over Facebook while you out on suspension, you come back and you're going to get them again. We've seen that happen before. Then a student leaves missing uh, significant instruction time. So, you know, what does it not do? It does not support your academics by any means. I mean, you can staple a, a section of worksheets together. You can tell a student to, you know, do like we did when we were in class. They tell you to read chapter section, you know, chapter three, section one, do your section review, turn it in the next day. Y'all might talk. 15, 20 minutes, they showing a video X, Y, and Z, and then that's done. That was class. That's not class today. Because number one, everybody's not even able to read when we come to class to read chapter three, section two. And then for me to understand how to even be able to write a complete sentence on this section review, I don't know how to do that. You know, so therefore we know that instruction time and everything else, all those goals, everything becomes stagnant and it does not help. Then suspension also makes the parent responsible for the education, the correction, and the prevention of poor behavior. And for many of our parents, none of those three elements are they able to provide what the corrective of what that should really look like. And we've seen that with the education piece specifically during this exterior extensive period of distance learning. I put together a word cloud um, just to simply ask this question, does this image align? If you haven't known by now, this image is a mortarboard. Uh, it's a, a cap. It's, it's your traditional, um, you know, traditional graduation cap. And so when you look at all of the words that are encompassed to depict this image, none of it aligns. Think about some of the terms that are found on this particular graduation cap. From the work that you do each and every day, do you find that this is aligning to the purpose of putting on the cap and gown? Or does it not? It definitely does not align. Well said, Miss Sagely. Can you dig deeper? You know I can. Um, well, I just look at. Well, at first I didn't recognize that it was a. I mean, I was reading the words, and then when you when you pointed out it was a mortarboard, I thought, oh no, no, because uh, students that are feel you know that are going through all those are not going to graduate. They're not you know if they're not making progress, if they if they feel negative if they have all these things stacked against them it's an, it's not going to allow them to graduate it's not going to further their education so um that's why that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. great take great take someone else share your perspective does this image align no i oh sorry I think a lot of times kids will give up because they've heard you're bad, you're bad, you can't do this, you're not going to amount to anything. So they and they hear it, unfortunately, sometimes from their families at home. So they begin, then begin to believe that. So 
uh, they'll drop out or they won't try to do anything further. They'll just think, well, I'm, I'm always in trouble. I'm always bad. Everybody says that. So that's what they believe about themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, say it, well, say it, well, say it. Someone else, does this image align? No, this image does not align at all. Um, it's kind of like whenever you have a student that has failed, they have poor progress, poor attendance, they're misunderstood. Now that student has a fixed mindset that I'm never going to be able to be better than what I'm currently in. And so it doesn't align at all. It actually shows that, hey, what is our investment in a student like this? Are we changing their mindset? Are we helping them become better? Because you have a lot of kids that don't have the confidence to believe that there's anything better for them just because of the circumstances that they are in. So this doesn't align and it doesn't do us any justice putting people back in environments that they're already struggling with whenever we have to show them that there's success in them. Well said. Well, well said. Well said. Everybody's perspectives are aligning. When we think about our role as instructional leaders, as we think about our roles as um, whether it be, you know, life coaches, whether it be supporting teachers with their instructional delivery, how does this whole concept of suspension, where is the highlight to celebrate an achievement of any sort? Do any of the words shown provide a sense of hope? Do any of the words shown provide a sense of achievement? If not, I challenge you to keep this with you, and I will share this at the conclusion, just to take a deep thought, just to have it as a tool to refer back to. And if you feel led to share this with your respective leadership teams and teachers, I would definitely do so as well. Because what it says is we have in the mindset our mission statements, our vision statements, our goals, countless meetings that we sit in, we hear all the time, student achievement, student achievement, on time, on track, on a mission, to achieve and we will succeed. We say that at Cherokee, you know, 100% uh, college and career ready. We say that at high school, you know, it's a great day to be a rougher, you know, and the list goes on of the colloquial uh, conversational pieces. But at the same time, this is worth mentioning as well, because this is what derails us from reaching that potential, because the frequency of getting rid of one, two, three, four, five, six, those one, two, three, four, five, six here and there, while it might not seem like a lot, it is very, very insightful as these become the ones we write off today become those that have children and then the cycle continues because then they start back at ECC, come back up. And then if they graduate 12th and they have children, then we continue on the cycle. And if we stay in the, in the realm of service long enough, then we will get to the point where we will continue this whole concept of, you know, generational, generational, continuum and 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 that's that that will continue to stagnate our growth um as educators as 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 a district and and what we are up against now in in 2020 getting ready for 2021 so our first strategy that i wanted to make mention of is in reference to r and r and that is a reflection room so what is a reflection room a reflection room is a way in which you can provide immediate and specific intervention that students are able to return to the academic environment without being sent home for OSS. Whether it's a teacher and student issue, whether it is a, a group of student issue, um, whether it be um, just an individual action, there is within a 24 hour time period 
a reflection meeting that is needed to be had with a reflection teacher who is trained as well as with an administrator that you come together and you extensively talk through a situation with three points that you are looking to uh, as the outcome of the meeting. That is to number one, reflect on what has happened, okay, extensively. You then look at how can you repair what has been done? If it was a fight, if it was cuss words, if it was, um, you know, academic misconduct, we look at what we can repair. And then we also look at how we can reform. How can I ensure that if I encounter the stressors or the triggers that led up into a certain action, how can I then, if I'm approached or if I'm in, in, in experiencing these same emotions or these same thoughts, how can I then redirect and be able to handle a situation or respond to a situation in a way that won't elicit me to end up in an administrator's office with suspension on the table as one of the disciplinary consequences. This reflection room is definitely a way in which your closed door is very confidential. It's going to take time as leaders to really work it. But I would suggest for us like assistant principals, principals on the call, definitely identify that additional leadership team member that you can really extensively talk through, have conversation about what this is going to look like when you're having a reflection room meeting, because it's going to rely a lot of trust on them not to go back and to talk in the teacher's lounge, not to go back, talk with the other students, not to go back. This is a confidential matter. This is a way in which we can restore a relationship in a quick manner. If it's between a student and a teacher, we have them all come in and then we have an additional team member. That's that reflection team member that's trained. Now, the piece that comes to that is the reflection teacher. If they're the one that has had a problem, you will need to have some additional reflection team members that have been trained. They have talked with you. They have understood what this role looks like and the magnitude of the responsibility and the confidentiality in order for this to be successful and to be a measure that can really support a student who has made a bad choice or has engaged in some unfavorable behavior so that they can be redirected and then be able to then assimilate back into the flow of things without warrant them a two or three day suspension. Okay. And so we're referring to this as a reflection room, an R and R. I could see this definitely being wonderful at, and I'm saying this because I know the, the 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 layout. Like for example, you have the life coaches for all three houses are encompassed in one office. And so for example, if we know that if it was in House Invictus and we have Miss Bunch has had encountered uh one of her students has had uh has you know had an uh, you know engaged in some behavior that's unfavorable. Now Miss Dawkins would know that as the principal for the house, she has trained Miss Bunch to be that reflection room um educator or that reflection room team member. And they know that they're going to schedule a time where everyone, where all four, or maybe it's five, it's two students and another teacher, they all come together and they're meeting together in, um, in a closed room. And then there is going to be notes that are taken, okay, in a way that makes sense based on what has occurred. And then you have kept that as a record that this is one of the measures that you've taken in to address this situation, because we don't want to start building on situation, on situation, on situation. Each situation should be taken from a different, um, it should be taken really, well, the way I'm going to say this is this, no matter if that same type of behavior or whatever transpired the first time, if it occurs again, then you may need to utilize a different alternative, okay? But if there is a unique situation that happens that's totally opposite, that would also warrant another reflection room for that measure. I feel like, you know, we become so like we're counting or keeping a tally on how many students misbehave. And so if you misbehave twice in a week, then you suspend it. You see what I'm saying? Versus taking each individual um, infraction 
for what it's worth as an individual infraction, not building on prior, you know, uh, behavior patterns or, beha or poor behavior leading to that second or third or fourth infraction. If the infraction is different in nature, then it will warrant a different reflection room uh, opportunity. OK, and so with the reflection room, here are the three questions that you're really wanting to ask. And so if you're needing to ask additional, definitely, by all means, do so. But here are the three questions that should be asked and that should be talked through from each party that is represented who has engaged in that in that time of that act of that misconduct and whatever that nature is. OK, and so again, this is referring to as the reflection room. You may, this may be a classroom, but whatever it needs to be, it needs to be free of distraction and knowing that you all are going in behind closed doors and having that conversation. The reflection room uh, team member, in addition to an administrative team member, their purpose is to be a neutral voice. They're not siding with anyone. They are just as like the administrator in the room. It's just that it is another person that is coming in to take, whether it be the, whoever you decide to take the notes. But at the end of this, you know that you have engaged in this conversation and that all items have been addressed and that by the time you leave that room, and it may take 30 minutes, it might take an hour, but by the time you unpack and get everything ready to go, you leave the room knowing that this is another opportunity for us to take a step in the right direction. We're not leaving here upset. We're not, we might have differing opinions about what has transpired and everything else like that. But we, at this point, at this time of having this reflection room conversation, we are saying that we are leaving these doors and that when we leave here, we are going to respectfully move forward while we acknowledge what transpired today or yesterday. We know that moving forward, what I need to do and what the other person needs to do. And, and when I say it that way, it's just simply saying that respectfully, this is what's going to continue to set us apart. Have I engaged in one of these? Yes, I have. I have at the secondary level and I have also at elementary level. And so even though it may seem kind of, you know, uh, like it doesn't mean anything to kindergarten, but be, I'm, I'm being honest with you, it does. Does it seem like it's going to be laughed at as a 12th grader? No, I've seen it work. And the schools that I've seen it work at are schools where you would think is they just going to laugh at either way. Like they're not going to understand in kindergarten, but no, they do. And then are they not going to understand in 12th grade? No, they do. It's just the willingness and the open mindedness to accept a measure like this. It's going to rely totally on us. So that is the reflection room um, alternative. Dr. McIntosh, I yeah. just, we do something very similar to this um, right now, uh, the life coaches, where we, and we just call them restorative circles. Yeah. And what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of times in those, those conversations, we kind of get to the source of why the student is acting the way that they are, why they're behaving. And a lot of times it's not that they came to school and they're so mad at the teacher in first hour. It just so happened that that is where it, it erupted, but it started mm -hmm. from. It was because I didn't, I went to bed last night and I did not eat, or there was a fight all night long in my home and I was up all night and I didn't get any rest and, you know, or there's a need that's not being met. So I just think if, if we took more time to, you know, allow the students to be human sometimes. It's almost like we expect them to um, deal with a lot of the things that they deal with and be able to, you know, compose themselves when sometimes we deal with things as, a, as adults and we don't always compose ourselves the way that, that we need to. So can you imagine a student dealing with some things that number one, are situations that they didn't ask for, um, they didn't cause them and they don't deserve them. And they're trying to figure out how to come to school and be as normal um, as they are supposed to be. And then they just have all of these emotions. And I think what Ms. Menifee said that we touched on a lot yesterday in Superintendent's Council is that we need to be mindful that sometimes people are not okay. And a lot of the behaviors that we deal with, they are just adverse reactions of things that have taken place in their lives when we haven't been there. 
you know, so I think that, you know, we could just take more time to understand our students, give them an opportunity to explain what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, you know, and if they need a moment to collect their, their thoughts, let them do that. And if talking it out is not the way and they feel better, I've seen uh, Coach Bunch and, you know, Mr. Eddie alike use, here's a piece of paper and you write down what you're feeling and we can discuss from there, whatever method we need to do to ensure that, you know, we are putting the student, you know, first and foremost and keeping them in the building where they need to be learning. I think that's the most important thing. Most definitely. And so Ms. Bunch, I, I, I'm, I definitely, the, the wording like you said, of, of what's already taking place, that, that's excellent. So whether it be a whether it be a restorative circle, whatever it might be, the intentionality behind our actions at the end of the day, just like you have said, we've got to really look at what's at the heart of the matter. And, and many times it might be, yeah, th they might have called a teacher out of their name, but it wasn't directed at the teacher. And so like I get it. The times have changed and I'm not I'm not I'm not compromising on, on my integrity of it and all because I wouldn't have been living had I used some of the words that I hear how we're referencing adults. But nevertheless, I will say this, that it's going if we're going to make a difference, we've got to take all of these accounts into and we and we and using our words and being able to address something and having that student to be able to understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm correcting you, but I'm correcting you out of love. And the way to correction is to keep you here at this school. But I'm going to also have this opportunity to state that what you said was inappropriate, the way you said it, and that, you know, because of when you're experiencing this, let's approach this from this perspective as we continue to move forward. So I'm very glad to uh, I'm very glad that you shared that with us. And, and, and it's good to know. And like I said, I know that there are great things that are happening. These are not all of the measures that are there to to uh, as to serve as an alternative, but they are definitely a menu to give us something to for us to continue to navigate and to be successful in the days ahead. So thank you, Ms. Bunch, for that. <clears throat> As we move on, the next piece I'd like to, uh, the next technique I'd like to uh, mention is a structured day. And um, a structured day is an intervention where the students are not assimilating in common times of conversation. The whole uh, highlights to the day have been reformed and the student is attending class, okay? But with a structured day, we want to make sure that the student, and this relies where the accountability is going to come in from our uh, from our print from our lead from our school leaders, even with our our coaches, um, and then additionally even with building counselors, behavior interventionists. Everyone plays a role in this because we want to always be sure that not only the classroom teacher, but as well as everyone that should be involved is involved. And you really can't ever have too many people involved because our young people, you know, holding someone accountable. They don't know at the onset. Sometimes they fight us with it. But at the end of the day, they love structure. But also they're also two times trying to be ahead of us in regards to seeing if we're really going to, you know, keep our word or hold through to our word. So in a structured day, um, a student might come to school and they might eat breakfast. But rather than eating with their friends, they know that they've got to go to a, uh, to a to a location that has been designated, you know, for them. They know that they're not in with their friends. They know that they're released five minutes before the bell um, and, and that they are to be, you know, outside of the class and going in. They're not in passing period with others. We know that if they are serving as a, in a structured day, that they may not be found at, uh, they're not permitted for, you know, those extracurricular activities, whether it's prep rallies, all of those other things, because we're sending the message that you have been unsuccessful with your behavior in the aspect of assimilating with uh, your peers, with others in the school community. So however, you are still a member of the school community, but nevertheless, your day is going to be structured that you have to consistently, the only, flow, the only flow for you is your academics. You're getting all of the parts of the day that everyone else is, except for the highlights, such as, you know, the, 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 the time of lunch with friends, you know, the hanging out or whatever it might be, but we are structuring your time and that, you know, 
know, this is the uh, expectation that you have to follow each and every day. And then also knowing that like what they call sack or we call it reformation. I know Creek calls it reflection and I think um, it's rejuvenation, I think at Pershing. But nevertheless, whatever it is, your after school, your after school detention is definitely needing to be had on the days that a student is serving a structured day because also you're staying and you're giving of your time. And that's the way that I shape that conversation for our students. You have you know, taken away from your time uh, in the day to engage in this behavior. So therefore, in order to for me to communicate to you the reason for you staying after school or having to be required to stay after school or to come up for Saturday school is to simply say this, I'm going to ensure that, you know, I've come into this role. I've come into, you know, this school to support your education. And I want to make sure that you get the most of the time that you need for your academics. And so definitely if, if in, in, in looking at what that after school detention, it needs to be intentional. It's not sitting there with your iPhones and your AirPods. If you don't have homework assignments, the administrator or the leadership team has already, or the life coaches have already gotten with the teachers that you have to do a great audit. And for those and for those classes that you have not successfully completed or have, um, a, you know, a satisfactory grade, we're looking at what additional assignments can you complete in the absence of you having formal class wide homework to complete during the time that you are sitting with a, with the team member that is being paid to serve as a, as as an as an after school detention personal coordinator. And so it's all about being very intentional. We then say, oh, they don't take this seriously. They don't take that seriously. If we have everything planned for them, you and because structure day is just that, it's structure. They're structured with every single thing. Maybe they are performing where they should academically in all of their classes. Then that's where it comes to maybe we're working on a community service project. So just as Ms. Menifee is over student life, we might be where there is an initiative that the high school is working on, or maybe even in another building where she is able to support and then provide um, you know, a community, a community wide impact that maybe helps us as a district, or maybe it help, helps us as a, a, the city of Muskogee. But there must be, it needs to be predetermined. It needs to already be established, and it needs to be where the student can follow through with it, and that they can successfully complete. And then also looking at if it's going to be purposeful teacher support. If there is a teacher that has agreed that this child can stay, you know, or this you know student can stay with me to serve that, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be limited to being your grader. It wouldn't be limited to being you know looking and having access to confidential information or just whatever it might be. But it needs to be purposeful. Everything that we do needs to be purposeful. And so knowing that um, we're just with a structured day, we're cutting down on the time of you know where or we're sending the message that you know you're still a part of the learning community but at the same time we're, your day is being reformed because of a b and c behaviors that you've communicated and we're sending the message that you are still a part of this learning community but we have made some alterations to your day for an extended period well for a period of time that would be depending upon your judgment and your discernment as um as as a, as a leadership team member, but ultimately we are working to ensure that a student knows, okay, I know that, you know, these types of days I, I really not liking this, so I'm going to have to get it together. But then we're also teaching them how to get it together in the aspect of whether they're serving with their community service project, whether they're having that opportunity when you are assigning a structured day to them that upon their, you know, re-entry again, because re-entry is critical to any any measure taken. Re-entry is critical. And I've sent that form out in our September meeting and I'll send it out to you even after this if you need it. But that re-entry, you're setting the tone of when, when I encounter this again, how am I going to respond? If we don't take that time, then we're going to have to make more time to put in log entries, to write referrals, and to continue to down the cycle of these alternative to suspension menus. So we can either take the time on the front end or we can take the time doing it again. So it's just, it, it depends on what we're wanting to do. But a structured day, uh, in a structured day, I have seen that from different site visits, even out of state, of how different school sites work their um, structured day. So if you're wanting more information on that, definitely get with me um, and we can uh, continue to navigate uh, for that, for that, um, for that uh, alternative. 
Then we have the alternative, the culture building project. And so with a culture building project, we're, I'm, I'm looking at, again, a lot of this is, is, is really working on the two terms of reflecting and restoring, but a culture building project. And so I'm going to read through kind of what a culture building project would look like. And so a culture building project is, um, is a project that is geared towards uh, a supporting inappropriate behavior in the classroom, and it works to repair and restore relationships with the students in the classroom. So as we talked about with, the, you know, uh, Ms. Bunch had talked to, alluded to um, a restorative circle. The thing is to keep in mind with a culture building project, this would be reserved for when in class interruptions have occurred or major issues have happened. Maybe the girls, a, a group of girls have gotten together and they've gotten themselves into some mischief. Maybe the fellows have engaged in some misconduct that, you know, it's brought itself and it started at home, but then it's done brought itself to school. And we're needing to have a time for everybody that's involved to come together. And so this will be where you might want to have maybe two, uh, one or two, or maybe more team members that are coming together to facilitate a whole conversation where everybody is able to speak in a way that everybody is able to see. And that's why I say the circle is, is basically that, um, but it builds culture. So that's why I was referring to it as a culture building project. We're all in a large circle. So we're in a room that is closed. We've set a meeting time and this is taken seriously. We're not laughing. We're setting what norms and expectations are to have this opportunity because I would explain this in the absence of you coming to school or in the absence of you being suspended from school, from engaging in the conversations and the behaviors that you have engaged in to bring you to this point, this is going to be, this is your alternative. So if you're not wanting to spend additional time at home, this is what we're going to do because I'm going to record this meeting. And if we have further, um, you know, behaviors that are warranting, you know, attention in this manner, now, if it's a whole nother subject or another problem, that gets a, that gets its own culture project. But right here, we're setting the tone that we're leaving today better than we uh, than we entered. But everybody will have the opportunity to speak for a certain period of time. We're not going to go back and forth, but we are going to respectfully make sure that everybody that's involved has an opportunity to have their input, to have their voice heard, and to then also understand those next steps of how you collectively figure out how you're going to move back into and assimilate into the school community, whether that be in the classroom, whether that be out on the field, whether that be on the court, wherever it is, we've got to send that message. One thing that we don't do, and in this particular year has been even more so the reason we don't do it, in a socially distanced world, we're not doing a whole lot of face-to-face -face anymore. But as long as that mask is on, if you got to get into the gymnasium at the high school, if we got to go to the gym, I'll have a gym class. We just have that another time. We're going to have this opportunity. So we're going to distance out and we're going to tackle what we need to tackle. It's good to tackle things on the front end rather than waiting and letting things fester or going to just different, you know, two or three here, two or three there to get the message across. No, everybody's coming together because we hide behind screens, we hide behind phones, we do all of that. But when we surface and we sit down and we take ownership for that mess that we text that that foolishness that we sent on Snapchat and every other app, then this is the opportunity for us to really unpack and able uh, for us to strategize and be able to then dive forward and to assimilate back into the classroom with some sense and with some decency and some order and most importantly, some respect. So Again, the uh, the form the former reflection room reserved kind of more so for like when it's teachers or small, small numbers and groups. But these culture building projects, this can be seen and taken into a larger audience because what you're doing is you're really addressing all of the questions that are here. And then also each and every student has that opportunity to engage in that conversation piece. Now, again, does that take time? Yes, it takes time. But everything that we do as we are being intentional, I can't tell you of anyone that would look a frown upon us taking some time to really listen to our students. We get so bogged down with the emails, with the meetings, with the observations, with PL focus, with this, with that. With I mean, it's so much, but I get it. 
the best joy that I've always had that I have every time that I get that opportunity is to have my eyes right engaged with the other scholars that are here at Cherokee. And I know that's the same for you. And so with that in mind, I'm just saying, put it to the side. It'll get done. It doesn't, it's secondary anyway, because if we don't take care of what's right in front of us, we're going to look up and all that paperwork and all that, we're not going to have that because we're not going to have the students. So if we're not taking care of what's in front of us, what's walking in the hallways every day, what's in, what's filling the classrooms, what's, you know what I mean, what we're doing, all the lesson planning and everything for, then we won't have to worry about it because we won't have, number one, we won't have, we won't have a district. We won't have any students. And so just taking care of what's laying right, what's, what's right before us, what's right before us. And so that is that culture building project, reflecting and restore. Some call it a restorative circle. You might even have heard of a restorative circle. If you're having them, fine and good. That's excellent. Definitely make sure that everything that we do, that we're intentional, you know, setting those expectations and norms. That means no phones in the room or phones have to be in your pocket. If your phone is out, then you dismissed and we'll assign you another disciplinary consequence because you made it clear that, you know, you're unable to be respectful and, and to put your phone away and engage in this conversation. OK. Then I want to talk through a community impact and what a community impact initiative is. It's a three to five day assignment for a student that who is repetitively just misbehaved and engaged in activities that violate learning uh, in a school setting. And so this would be what that what that student would complete uh, as a community uh, impact. And so um, it's, a, it's a school community service project, and it would en encompass the following. Um, it may be completed outside of school, uh, before, after, uh, free time, whatever. Uh, the project may be totally selected by the student. We want it to be meaningful and unique to the student, but we also want to make sure that we're providing our professional judgment as school leaders as to how this project is going to enhance the overall experience for the students as a whole, okay? This is a part of looking at what the student has done, warranting this, uh, this consequence, but at the same time, we want to be sure that um, it is going to support the school community. So we challenge with our higher level thinking. You know, when we look at Bloom's taxonomy and we're looking at, you know, levels five and six, we're wanting to create, we're wanting to analyze, we're wanting to dig deep, we're wanting our, uh, the students to really have uh, ownership in what they're saying, but just not to be doing something, just to be doing it. It needs to be purposeful. It needs to be meaningful. And so in order to ensure that, we want to make sure that uh, we're logging uh, service days and times. Um, if it's something that's done off campus, you know, for example, if we have a network of community, um, you know, members, businesses, whatever that might have needs where a student could do some volunteer work and maybe then write a, a presentation that they're going to, you know, maybe they're going to present it to their leadership team. Maybe they're going to present it to their class. Maybe they're going to come to one of the three houses leadership classes and, 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 pre and present. And that be a part of the consequence. And, and I know that you get it. OK, so we're we're doing a uh, we're doing presentation and performance for misbehavior. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, is that a student has extensively taken a period of time where they have worked on a project, maybe engaged in some uh, community service or maybe they've worked and did a, and, 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 and developed a project initiative by working with some of the student groups that are on campus uh, through working with student life and then be able to then deliver and to present some of the work that they have done for this extended period of time. What does that look like? It's very open-ended because it should be intentional and based upon the students' needs. We don't want to get, a, we want to get away from so much teacher-centered, so much, um, you know, so much administrative, I'm telling you this, you're suspended, you're going to detention, you're doing this. It's no, this is what I have observed. How can I then help you to move forward in the best way? Are, did you receive the response that you were wanting by the behaviors that you were communicating? Once you identify what those challenges were, how can you best move forward? How can I best um, ensure that I support you in, in, in reshaping your behavior, in reshaping the occurrences or the other uh, infractions which led you to end up in my office? OK, and so this is an accountability piece. 
I would say it would be very appropriate to have a student to also serve in ISS while they are completing this community impact initiative, because they're also in the absence of them completing their assignments, which have been assigned to them while they're in the ISS room, they would be able to complete this even if it's like if it's community service, we know that they would be off campus and they would be responsible for that. But ultimately, if they do not have the transportation ways or means, then it would be something that would need to be held to being on campus. And so it might be throughout the instructional day where they are excused knowing that the ISS coordinator or, or personnel that, that, that serves as the leader for ISS, that they know where the student is going. The student will be supervised as they complete their community impact, but at the same time that there is accountability and measure that that student knows what time they ought to return to finish their day out in ISS. And so these are, you know, four kind of critical ways that we can work strategically to keep our students at school. The assignment itself is not meant to be punitive. It is meant to make sure that the student is taking initiative to take on those additional responsibilities in order uh, to reform, in order to, to support not only their personal reform, but for the reform of the behaviors and for the reform of the trajectory of the school um, as a whole. And so that's why I have called that community impact. While it might be impacting the community and the city of Muskogee, it is also at the same time com, com, um, impacting and supporting uh, the ongoing improvement efforts for the, for the young person themselves. And I know that we're right at 1130, so I'm going to kind of close us out and I want to open up for any questions. But um, I wanted to really give you these three F's. Uh, concerning student issues before we before you have to log off. And if you have to log off, I definitely understand that. But before we assign disciplinary consequences, I would just ask that you would print this out and that you would keep this and that you would really refer to this. I've gone through some extensive trainings in regards to this, and I want to be sure that I communicate this with you. And the three Fs are this. Do I have all of the facts? Do I have the feet? What about my feelings? And then also my future. And so when I'm thinking about facts, do I have all of the facts in a matter that I'm just that, that, that has been presented to me? Are there any uncertainties with the stories that I've been told from the teacher, from the student, from other um, from other observers, bystanders, whatever it might be? Also, am I confident that the student identified in an infraction have given an authentic account of the events or the information pertaining to a situation warranting this disciplinary action? Also, when we're talking about feelings, am I responding out of anger, frustration, or disgust in the situation? How might the student feel in this situation? How would our parents respond to the situation when I make the call? Then thinking about future, how will we move forward in this situation? What consequences will adequately align to reform and restore poor behavior? Is suspension the best option? Will this solve the issue and prevent behavior from returning? What is my plan to restore the relationship with the student? What is what will the school what is the school's plan with each stakeholder's input? Students, counselors, teachers, administrators, because every time behavior infractions occur, relationships are challenged in their integrity. And so as we know that we have a unique responsibility to continue to develop those strong, meaningful relationships with each member of the school community, I would ask that you would reserve and keep these three Fs concerning student issues and discipline and really with the work that we do each and every day at the heart of the matter. Then finally, my closing thought, please remember when we suspend a student, we are not only suspending the student from coming to school. We are suspending their opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive in a way that can transform their life. Again, please remember, when we suspend a student, we are not only suspending the student 
from coming to school. We are suspending their opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive in a way that can transform their life. I will stop sharing now. I hope that I have not put anyone to sleep during this time. But um, I, I have, I, I have, I don't think I, I have, it's been a while since I've talked this long. I think it was professional development in the fall. I'll, um, I'll stop recording and I want to know, um, are there, does anyone have any, any questions? I hope this was not boring for, 